So welcome to the December verse virtual uh, reading again. Our editor, Jim, has an announcement about um, closed caption in case you might be needing that. I'm constantly learning new things about Zoom and they're constantly adding new things. It is possible for you to turn on or off closed captioning on your individual Zoom. Um, it has been enabled, so if you need that, go ahead and turn on closed captioning. It won't affect anyone else. I also uh, confirmed that for any of our recordings that are posted on YouTube, YouTube will do closed captioning for the recordings as well. So if you have any issues with hearing, like I do, or paying attention, sometimes the closed caption helps. Where is it? Yeah, so far, though, I'm pretty deaf. I haven't needed it, luckily. Um, but a day will probably come, judging by my parents' deafness. So we're going to get started. And I think our first reader, and, and Jim, if you would um, allow people to enter, if I'm otherwise disposed. Um, and we're going to get started with, I think, uh, Jackie Oshiro. Jacqueline Oshiro's ninth collection of poems, Divine Ratios, was published by LSU Press in 2023. She's received grants from the John Simon Guggenheim and Ingram Merrill Foundations, the NEA, and the Witter Biner Prize from the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters. Her poems have appeared in the New Yorker, Paris Review, American Poetry Review, Best American Poetry, the Norton Anthology of Jewish American Literature, the Penguin Book of the Sonnet, and many other anthologies and journals. She's Distinguished Professor of English at the University of Utah. Take it away, Jackie. Okay. Well, I thought I would be gutsy and start with works in progress. Um, I've been, I'm on sabbatical. I'm in New York, not Utah. And uh, I'm working on this project to do with Giotto's Scrovegni Chapel. Giotto, it was painted in the early 13th century, 1303 to 1305, a very rich guy, Scrovegni paid for it. So the materials are amazing particularly the blue, which is made of crushed up lapis lazuli and egg yolk, and uh, is astonishing to look at. I saw it first uh, in 1981, a while ago, uh, and it was my introduction to Christianity. About, I mean, I think I knew about the crucifixion, that was about it. And I, there were the lives of Mary and Jesus, there were the vices and virtues. I absolutely fell in love with this work of art, went back 40 years later and liked very different things and, and, and managed to get my university to give me a grant to go there, spend three weeks there, three hours a night. It was amazing. So I've been writing all these Giotto poems. I thought I'd read you two of them and then get to works from my book. These are very much works in progress. Who knows? The second of them has the date December 1st on it. The first one I thought for the season. So let me read you these. Um, so the first one is uh, nativity. You enter and it might be 40 years ago. Space dissolves, no floor, no ceiling, no walls, only incoherent, hectic blue and intermittent gangs of roving angels. Now hovering, now taking in each view, you too begin to see as blue unravels into frames of recognizable tableau crammed with homey day-to-day -day details, spindle, clothesline, sack, unbuckled shoe. That first time I was waylaid by the angels, here exultant, there inconsolable, decoding each event. First, how it feels to roam the sky above a flimsy stable where a virgin reaches for her newborn son. They filled me in on each alien miracle, annunciation, 
passion, resurrection, like a mute, excitable Greek chorus. My strongest memory, their celebration. And they are celebrating, I suppose. But what, at 25, I read as revelry, I now say as single-minded purpose. Their eyewitnesses, armed with a story, corroborating evidence, clear proof. Some proclaim it to the open sky, but one leans out over the manger roof, telling what he's seen to two rapt shepherds, and grows so fully in his narrative, they listen with their backs to their own herds. Such, depicts the virtuoso painter, is the unrivaled potency of words, his rare limitations front and center. Out of humility? Or is it hubris to pinpoint the place where paint can't enter and rush there headlong with your brush, still holding tightly to what's very near? Perhaps a simultaneous embrace of the inaccessible and the familiar is the lodestar of every masterwork. All I know is that whoever comes here will be able to find whatever they seek, even as it alters over time. A girl finds angels partying when she comes back. She'll see a you nuzzling a newborn lamb. She's a mother too among the sheep. A dreamer, she'll notice Joseph's dream. In other nativities, is he asleep? She's not sure, but she doesn't think so. What is it exactly that makes her weep? She doubts it's even possible to know. The beauty of the place, she weeps so rarely, or its walls disconcerting innuendo that she's missing far more than she can see. Each time she shifts her gaze, the contents grow. Though they're already infinite, her eye just too slow, too circumscribed, too narrow. Has anyone ever seen it all? Perhaps. He's at the perfect angle, that angel peering in at Anna through the window. Yet another thing we'll never know. Perhaps, though even that's not certain, Giotto. And one more of these, this is baptism crucifixion. Yet another of Giotto, oh, I should explain that the, that the frescoes telling the stories appear in rows. And I came to realize that what was on top of what really mattered, okay? But they're in rows, so it starts with Mary's life, goes around, and then it's Jesus' life, okay? Yet another of Giotto's inspired conjunctions, baptism directly over crucifixion, body over body, one robust, one thin, as if to suggest that a slow transfiguration has been steadily occurring all along through miracle, ordeal, betrayal, the cleansing of a dozen pairs of feet, the whip, the truncheon, the false tribunal, the fatal burden on an uphill street. Not all paths are direct. Some are circuitous. Consider the labyrinth, the intestine, the double helix, the fugue or oratorio en route to silence, the instrument of torture, the human heart, the nail, the cross, the egg yolk crushed with stone, whatever turns a body into spirit. Okay, those are the new poems. Oh, are you there? There you are, okay. So now I'll read from an actual book. This is my last book, Divine Ratios. I want it judged by its cover. Um, and I'll, I'll read two short poems and one long poem from this book. So the first of these is Camouflage. An abandoned feather, a dried out leaf, a branch, a shed antler, a toad, a stone. In the high, tawny grass, a tawny bas-relief of half-hidden pronghorns on the run. 
Geese overhead, gridlock drivers, close, leaning on their horns, thunder, a truck barreling down my street, rattling windows, an enormous semi when the earthquake struck. A branchless tree trunk is an obelisk until its top lifts off, flaps hulking wings and glides, a great horned owl prowling at dusk. Soon, perhaps we'll learn, a cricket sings, or is that just evening's quickening pulse, to rise and reappear as something else? And I'll read Shanghai Taxi. I got to go to China. My daughter was there for a couple of years teaching uh, English and improving her Chinese. And I ended up writing a series of villanelles about China, a crazy thing to do. But I was kind of thrilled by poetry's centrality in Chinese culture. Anyway, this one is Shanghai Taxi. My daughter teaches us to recite a poem in Chinese, a poem all school children learn. Li Bai, bright moonlight, frost, missing home. It's for the teacher who taught her the poem. We practice in the taxi to the station. Everyone in China can recite this poem. Our driver, stunned, joins in, has us mimic him. Slowly, he exaggerates each tone. Bright moonlight, frost on the ground, missing home. He laughs and laughs, amused by our game. While I'm trying, impossible, to imagine all my countrymen united by a poem. Though once a cab driver recited Omar Khayyam all the way from the Salt Lake Airport in Persian when I told him what I do, he missed home. And my father-in-law could reel off every psalm in Hebrew, a brief shtetl education. The sun will not smite or the moon, help will come. How can we sing God's song away from home? And I'll just read one more poem, but it's not short. Uh, and uh, I was very lucky. Uh, this is a poem about Bryce Canyon. I would never have written it. I don't really think Bryce Canyon needs my poem. It's a pretty fabulous place. Uh, but uh, uh, at the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service, they asked a poet from each state to write about a national park. And I got the best gig because Utah has the best national parks and it doesn't have that many poets. So it kind of worked real well for me. And then amazingly, this past June, June 8th, they celebrated the 100th anniversary of Bryce National Park. And I got asked to read this poem on the edge of Bryce Canyon. It was sort of amazing. So this is Inspiration Point, Bryce Canyon, Utah. Maybe it was just for this, that God pulled water from dry land to rescue hoodoo after hoodoo. That's what they're called, a bastardization of voodoo, these unrepeatable needles of rock, geology's answer to flakes of snow. A sound enough hypothesis, dark magic, but I like God's approach, so straightforward. The light, the land, the sky, each feat of handiwork, a matter of a single uttered word. That's the first version. The clumsy second was more hands-on with dust and ribs required. Though it's a stretch to claim this place was planned. Maybe, just like us, God was stupefied. He rarely knew how any day would end. Had to see things finished to call them good. Here, he might even have done without the bric-a-brac of the days that followed, except the fourth days, bodies of light, essential for the colors of the stone, the greater light, especially adroit. Just watch it, nurse a puny flame at dawn, purple with an edging of vermilion, by sunrise to a full-fledged conflagration, then temper it to golden rose by noon, darker still as day begins to fail. 
The oranges go bronze, the reds maroon, the whole place solid indigo by nightfall, except on nights when a full or near full moon applies its inlay, mother of pearl, on a lamina of coral and carnelian. Or the moon's a no-show, no stone visible, just black on black, spikes and spires gone. That's when you look up. The sky's grand central, no light pollution, no clouds, conditions ideal, rush hours hubbub irresistible, the stars, its thronged commuters, cheek by jowl. The park has telescopes. I once saw Jupiter. But I prefer an open free-for-all, the peripheral inkling of a meteor, or was that a satellite or diving owl? Some flora and fauna did make their way here eventually, swashbucklers all, rattlesnake, manzanita, prickly pear, its shock of blossoms at the end of April, slow motion fireworks, the canyon floor lost beneath magentas, yellows, reds, or bristle cone pine launching spectacular high wire acrobatics off the cliff sides where that gifted horticulturist, the nuthatch, a glutton for its seeds, disseminates them when it stops to rest. Quite ingenious of God, if oddly fanciful, for so inveterate a fatalist. That is, if God's mixed up in this at all. The park prefers the Paiute explanation. The Hoodoos were once the legend people, shape shifters native to this region, turned for some unnameable transgression by vigilant coyote into stone their face paint still intact, their tradition of shape-shifting now upheld in unison, a nonstop frenzy of dissimulation, now a storm-tossed, now a tranquil ocean flocked by scarlet ibis, flink, pink flamingos, now dreamscape, now valley of the moon, now ransacked cathedrals, lost rose windows, now an amphitheater's hushed proscenium, now leafless aspens, elms, catalpas, willows, now phantom hollyhock, delphinium, now flashback, now panicked premonition, now truce, now skirmish, now pandemonium, now parachutes, a daredevil battalion floating toward an ill-fated attack, now blushing debutantes, their first cotillion, now parched oasis, now bivouac, close by each golden tent a golden torch now red robed russian choirs now ecstatic ovations from thick stands of golden birch now burnished temple now tarnished city now bands of acolytes in mosque in church or here assembling legends of coyote scrambling to get down on their untried knees and thank someone anyone for all this beauty, though maybe it's the frost they ought to praise, the real creator, according to science, how it would melt and freeze, melt and freeze, and then in a matter of mere eons, no wind involved, windy as it is, chisel what must be earth's most flimsy stone, limestone, siltstone, mudstone, into this. Not surprising, really, when you think what frost can achieve in seconds on a pane of glass. Always a revelation when a miniaturist takes his genius for precision large scale. The landscape behind the mystic Lama's Christ in the Ghent altarpiece, for example. An exhaustive primer of floral specimens rendered in botanical detail art both mainstay and intimate of science. Think Leonardo and science of art. What fools we were to leave the Renaissance behind us, to tear ourselves apart into more and more obscure specialization. Not that it matters here. Science and art, even in conjunction with their on-again, off-again Confederate religion, are speechless 
in the presence of this canyon. Even God needs two versions of creation at the start of Genesis. Some things defy a single overarching explanation. Maybe everything does, if you look carefully. And what's a day exactly when the sun hasn't yet been added to the sky? That third day might still be going on. Everything I'm staring at still raw. God on overdrive. The frost a madman consumed by each imaginary flaw. Am I a witness? An alibi? A spy? And what's this delirium? This terror? This awe? Is the sky hallucinating? Am I? Inspiration point. Bryce Canyon, Utah. Just let me stand here with an open eye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was absolutely astounding. <laughs> Thanks. I just loved it. And I wish that I could go to all those places right now, but I'll just have to imagine them. You're pretty feels... close to Bryce. <laughs> yeah. Well, our second feature, I'm going to have to dig up the bio here. Our second feature is Ellen Bass. And I'm sure all of you uh, are familiar with her work and with her teaching and with her generosity. Ellen Bass's most recent collection, Indigo, was published by Copper Canyon Press in 2020. Her other poetry books include Like a Beggar, The Human Mind, The Mules of Love. Her poems appear frequently in the New Yorker, American Poetry Review, and many other journals. Among her rewards are fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the NEA, and the California Arts Council, the Lambda Literary Award, and four Pushcart Prizes. She co-edited the first major anthology of women's poetry, No More Mass, and her nonfiction books include The Groundbreaking, The Courage to Heal, A Guide for Women Survivors of Child Sexual Abuse, and Free Your Mind, The Book for Gay, lesbian and bisexual youth, a chancellor emerita of the Academy of American Poets, Bass founded poetry workshops at Salinas Valley State Prison and the Santa Cruz, California jails, and teaches in the MFA writing program at the Pacific University. Take it away, Ellen. Thank you, Ravi. It's so great to be here with all of you. And Jackie, that was just such a gorgeous reading. I was, I was taken there. You, um, we, I actually visited Bryce last year, and then forty years ago, also, um, where I could, uh, it, you know, see see more because I could hike to more. But uh, it was, it was still, it was, it was just transporting. It was marvelous with all of the poems that you read uh, tonight taking us there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this poem is called Relax. Bad things are going to happen. Your tomatoes will grow a fungus and your cat will get run over. Someone will leave the bag with the ice cream melting in the car and throw your blue cashmere sweater in the dryer. Your husband will sleep with a girl your daughter's age her breasts spilling out of her blouse. Or your wife will remember she's a lesbian and leave you for the woman next door. The other cat, the one you never really liked, will contract a disease that requires you to pry open its feverish mouth every four hours. Your parents will die. No matter how many vitamins you take, how much Pilates, you'll lose your keys, your hair, and your memory. If your daughter doesn't plug her heart into every live socket she passes, you'll come home to find your son has emptied the refrigerator 
dragged it to the curb, and called the used appliance store for a pickup, drug money. The Buddha tells a story of a woman chased by a tiger. When she comes to a cliff, she sees a sturdy vine and climbs halfway down. But there's also a tiger below and two mice, one white, one black, scurry out and begin to gnaw at the vine. At this point, she notices a wild strawberry growing from a crevice. She looks up, down, at the mice. Then she eats the strawberry. So here's the view, the breeze, the pulse in your throat. Your wallet will be stolen. You'll get fat. Slip on the bathroom tiles in a foreign hotel and crack your hip. You'll be lonely. Oh, taste how sweet and tart the red juice is. How the tiny seeds crunch between your teeth. This poem is called The Morning After. You stand at the counter, pouring boiling water over the French roast, oily perfume rising in smoke. And when I enter, you don't look up. You're hurrying to pack your lunch, snapping the lids on little plastic boxes while you call your mother to tell her you'll take her to the doctor. I can't see a trace of the little slice of heaven we slipped into last night. A silk kimono, floating satin ponds and copper koi, stars falling to the water. Didn't we shoulder our way through the cleft in the rock of the everyday and tear up the grass in the pasture of pleasure? If the soul isn't a separate vessel we carry from form to form, but more like Aristotle's breath of life, the work of the body that keeps it whole, then last night, darling, our souls were busy. But this morning, it's like you're wearing a bad wig, disguised so I won't recognize you, or maybe so you won't know yourself as that animal burned down to pure desire. I don't know how you do it. I want to throw myself onto the kitchen tile and bare my throat. I want to slick back my hair and tap dance up the wall. I want to do it all all over again, dive back into that brawl, that raw and radiant free-for-all. But you are scribbling a, a shopping list because the kids are coming for the weekend and you're going to make your special crab cakes that have ruined me for all other crab cakes forever. One of the wonderful things of being uh, married when you're a poet is that all the times when your spouse irritates you, you can uh, examine whether or not there's a poem in there. I learned that a couple of decades ago um, when uh, when I wrote the first the first poem uh, when when both my wife and son were irritating me so much and uh, all of a sudden it occurred to me there was a poem in there and ever after I still get irritated but the first thing I do is go hmm what can I make of this this poem um this next poem is called uh bringing flowers to Salinas Valley State Prison and I wrote it when I was teaching there it was spring I think it was June uh, I live in Santa Cruz, California, and it just seemed like there were never so many flowers in the city as that June. And I had this persistent, irrational thought of just wishing that I could take my students out for a couple of hours, just on a little field trip, and then go back again, but just so they could see those flowers. And of course, that being impossible, I tried to do the next best thing, bringing flowers to Salinas Valley State Prison. When Mr. H saw the little meadow blooming on the steel table, he bowed to the starry faces of Jasmine. This is the first flower I've smelled in 20 years. And when I slid each man a bouquet in a paper cup, Mr. M said, 
I'll have such a short time with these. We spoke then about beauty and loss, the great themes of poetry. And when our time was done and the guards said they had to leave the flowers, most of the men acquiesced. But Mr. S insisted he had as a Native American a right to his rituals, sage, sweet corn, tobacco, and no one could stop him, it was the law, from taking these sacred plants back to his cell. Then he raised his cup and drank the water the flowers were drinking, and a small wind stirred in that windowless room. As we watched Mr. S quietly bite the heads off the Peruvian lilies, crushing their pink sepals and the gold inner petals flecked with maroon, swallowing the silvery filaments, their dark pollen-laden anthers, his mouth frothing with blossoms. This next um, poem uh, arose from a project that both Jackie and I took part in called New Voices, in which um, contemporary poets were asked to look at a um, image from the Holocaust and to write in response to it. And this is called Photograph. And, and the title is the uh, caption that was on the image that I was given. Photograph, Jews probably arriving to the Woods Ghetto, circa 1941 to 1942. Why is a horse here alongside the train? Two horses, yoked with leather harnesses, light silvering their flanks in the midst of the Jews descending. Where is the driver taking the cart, loaded with wooden planks? What is in the satchel that weighs down the arm of a woman in a dark coat, her hair parted on one side? A woman I could mistake for my mother in the family album. Only my mother was in Philadelphia, selling milk and eggs and penny candy because her mother escaped the pogroms, a small girl in steerage crying for her mother. What are the tight knots of people saying to one another? A star burns the right shoulder blade of each man, each woman. Light strikes each shorn neck and caps each skull. No one is yet stripped of all but a pail or a tin to drink from and piss in. Dread like sun sears the air and breaks over the planes of their faces. Light clatters down upon them like stones, but we can't hear it. Nor can we hear blood thud under their ribs. They will be led into the ghetto and then will be led out to the camps. But for now, the eternal now, the light is silent. Silent the shadows in the folds of their coats. The bones of the horse are almost visible. Their nostrils are deep, soft shadows. And the woman, who could be but is not my mother, still carries her canvas bag and, looking closer, what might be a small purse. I had a dog for uh, quite a lot of years, um, a big, wonderful um, mutt, 90 pounds of mutt. And uh, he loved poetry and when he was dying, I, I wrote this poem for him. It's called Ode to Zeke. I know he loved poetry because whenever there were poets in the house, he would always be very close and listen very attentively. Um, my son has a dog now that we do a lot of daycare for, and he has no interest in poetry whatsoever. Um, he's not a good listener. He's very beautiful, quite narcissistic. But um, Zeke, the, my old dog, um, was, was very interested in poetry. So this is for him, Ode to Zeke. Oh, breathing drum, 
O cask of dark waters, O decaying star, my barking heart, my breaking brother, what will seep into the space your body leaves? O huge 18 muscled ears, oscillating ossicles and cochlea, your busy canals, now hollow caves of quiet. I have said your fur is black, but you are silvered, rhymed with frost. You are the new moon. You are light in the dark house. How long will I see your shadow? O heavy hunk of existence. O great flank I have rested my head upon when I was too weak for human touch. Sleek leading man, you debonair dog. How people on the avenue stop to swoon. O splaying legs once faster than rabbits, canines slashing flesh, urgent thug, unstoppable thrust, O happy snapping at the wind. What do you remember now that you are mudside, mudslide, glacier melting, cliff collapsing into the sea? I have memorized your milky breath, your ballet leaps and whirly gigging, your princely patience as the children dressed you. Soccer, Zeke, in jersey and shorts, one paw on the ball. Snorkel, Zeke, with mask and fins. Bar mitzvah, Zeke, in a yarmulke and my father's silk tallit. Oh, my text of decrepitude, my usher to death, companion of 10,000 years. I'll fry you a fish. I'll sit by your bowl. Eat from my hand. I have nowhere to go. And this is the title poem from my most recent book, Indigo. As I'm walking on Westcliff Drive, a man runs toward me, pushing one of those jogging strollers with shock absorbers so the baby can keep sleeping which this baby is. I can just get a glimpse of its almost translucent eyelids. The father is young, a jungle of indigo and carnelian, tattooed from knuckle to jaw, leafy vines and blossoms, saints and symbols. Thick wooden plugs pierce his lobes and his sunglasses testify to the radiance haloed around him. I'm so jealous, as I often am. It's a kind of obsession. I want him to have been my child's father. I want to have married a man who wanted to be in a body, who wanted to live in it so much that he marked it up like a book, underlining, highlighting, writing in the margins, I was here. Not like my dead ex-husband, who was always fighting against the flesh, who sat for hours on his Zafu chanting Om and then went out and broke his hand, punching the car. I imagine when this galloping man gets home, he's going to want to have sex with his wife who slept in late, and then he'll eat barbecued ribs and let the baby teeth on a bone while he drinks a dark beer. I can't stop wishing my daughter had had a father like that. I can't stop wishing I'd had that life. Oh, I know, it's a miracle to have a life, any life at all. It took eight years for my parents to conceive me. First there was the war and then just waiting and my mother's bones so narrow, she had to be slit and I airlifted. That anyone is born, each precarious success from sperm and egg to zygote, embryo, infant is a wonder. And here I am alive, almost 70 years and nothing has killed me. Not the car I totaled running a stop sign or the spirochete that screwed into my blood. Not the tree that fell in the forest exactly where I was standing. My best friend shoving me backward so I fell on my ass as it crashed. I'm alive and I gave birth to a child. So she didn't get a father who'd sling her onto his shoulder and so much else she didn't get. I've cried most of my life over that. And now there's everything that we can't talk about. We love, but cannot take too much of each other. Yet she is the one who, when I asked her to kill me, if I no longer had my mind, 
we were on our way into Ross, shopping for dresses. That's something she likes, and they all look adorable on her. She's the only one who didn't hesitate or refuse or waver or flinch. As we strode across the parking lot, she said, okay, but when's the cutoff? That's what I need to know. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, beyond wonderful. And thank you so much for being here. And if you want more of this, folks, you need to sign up for Ellen's craft series, which will come right into your personal Zoom and you'll get hours of this, hours of Ellen and lots of other poets who are visiting. And it's the best thing I've ever had on my Zoom. So thanks sign so much, up. Bobby. Thanks so <laughs> much. Thanks. You can go to my website. It's super easy. It's just ellenbass.com. I know some of you have been in the craft talks. And if you haven't, I hope you will come. They're not terribly expensive, but if that's a problem, there's scholarships. So everybody's welcome. It's a really great series. I'm not staring you more. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for being here. And it's a really, really doubly hard act to follow you to. But some folks here are going to read a few poems. So Mary, you have a new book. Would you like to read something? I'll read a couple of short things from the book. It's called um, How to Become Invisible. And it's about living through uh, bipolar illness. The first poem is called Depression. Rising quickly, quietly at first, it brushes me with a soft wing. Darkness like the echo of some final cry. Sadness like the taste of cold iron. Salt on my lips. Tears rising, hot and bitter to blur my sight. Suddenly all is lost and I stand hopeless again in the litter of my days. Nothing can save me from the nothing in my heart. I can light candles, cook dinner, iron clothes and wash the floors. It doesn't matter. What you see is the event horizon of a black hole. There will be no escape from its terrible gravity swallowing my life as fast as I live it. And the other one is about the other, the other side of that particular illness, the, the high instead of the low. It's called irresistible. No way to stop it. A sudden eruption, hot as the first explosion of everything from nothing Adam to infinity in no time at all, swinging me into my next tsunami, an exponential rush of energy and light brighter than any sun, generating storms wild enough to carry worlds away and burn them all to ash. In rivers of incandescent plasma, I dance in my red boots over all objections, unregulated, free as God in his unreachable orbit. I ride joy like an unbroken horse, a rocket launched into the darkness that surrounds us all. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Our next reader will be Neil Creighton. And Neil, you're gonna have to Put the title of your book in because I don't I won't get it right. I'm not going to read from the Calhoun Chronicles. So it's summer here, and um, El Nino is back, uh, bringing all this terrible heat and uh, lots of days over forty degrees Celsius. And um, I'm going to read from my book Awakening, which was published a little while ago. And um, it, it's a, one of those you know four seasons sequences. There, I, I'm going to read the summer poem. It's just one day uh, that happened in that terrible summer. 
It was 48 degrees that day. I guess it's about 115 uh, Fahrenheit for you guys who have Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Uh, just call it summer. The familiar blue sky has disappeared. Through smoke haze, the sun rises and sets fluoro pink. The drought ridden, heat saturated continent blazes. The temperature rises to 48 degrees Celsius. We venture into its sledgehammer blow to fill up the sandstone bird baths. Hundreds of birds congregate around the precious water. There is no profligate splashing. The friar birds dip their slender curved beaks, rise to swallow, then dip again. From the Gladitia's pendant branches, hundreds of rainbow lorikeets drop to the precious water in iridescent flutter. I think of those estimates of 500 million animals lost. I see again the woman rushing through a fiery landscape, ripping off her shirt and wrapping it around a burnt koala. Someone posts a video of hundreds of kangaroos going hard up a smoke-filled hill. There are challenging images of horses and cattle lying prone in burnt-out paddocks. Behind them, a backdrop of blackened trees. The trees grow quickly and are burning. A fire truck moves along a fire trail. Someone says, better get that fire blanket up, mate. But as they fumble, the trees erupt. An ember storm envelops them and flames leap 30 metres above the trees and rush at the road. Keep going, Bob, the same voice says his voice filled with tension and encouragement. The word comes to the little coastal holiday towns. It's too late to pack up and go. There is only one road in and they are hemmed in by spotted gum forest. In surreal night in day light, Holidayers and locals huddle together on the beach. Fire rages to the dunes, leaping and roaring, crowning high above the treetops. Even the grasses on the low dunes burn. There is an audible gasp as a house explodes. A helicopter dumps a load of water on it, but there is no diminishment of flame. Flames are everywhere. It seems as if these scenes have been filmed through a deep red filter. At midday, it is as dark as night, blackness surreally saturated in red. The wind is howling and the sea surges and swells. A man, a tough guy used to hardship, flees with his family in his boat. He wears goggles and a mask. His voice is usually the flat intonation of one used to hiding his feelings. Now it bristles with unadorned emotion. The fire's just come through. Fuck. I hope everyone's just fucking. Fuck. Fuck the houses, man. Get into the water. It's fucking chaos. Watching those scenes of apocalypse. I can't not think of the post-inferno chaos and what will we leave for future generations? Seven billion humans inhabit and share with other life this finite blue planet. Is it possible to find a way to live on it and with it? Or will humans, following visionless leaders continue to grope a blind indulgent way squabbling scapegoating and consuming until nothing is left but warring remnants locked in ferocious conflict over the charred remains Thank you, Neil. That, that was 
intense. I have to ask you in the open mic, no more than five minutes, although that was terrific. Um, we don't want to be here all night. So our next reader is Judy. Hi, everyone. Fabulous readings by the two ladies to, that we began with. Just utterly amazing and wonderful. Uh, rather than read something new, I decided I would read um, one of my favorite poems from my last full-length book, Gro Groaning and Singing, which came out from Future Cycle in 2022. So this is on my perennial theme, or versions of a version of my perennial theme, which is memory. Saving the dead. And there's an epigraph. Our memory is the only help that is left to them. Theodore Adorno. We carry them inside us like persons still unborn, as if everything they might be again awaited them. The bodies of our mothers before we were born, the once coquettish bodies of our prim mothers, my mother balanced on a honeymoon hayrack, hayrick with my father, his palm sweeping her face towards his for a kiss, a white hibiscus flower blowing in her black, black hair. The bodies of our fathers, flat bellied in their crisp pressed uniforms, standing near the wings of the flying fortress on the deck of the Massachusetts, my father grins at a monkey on his lifted arm on a tiny island purpose-built refueling stop. All those kept safe for us by luck. Time startled and lurching forward, we still carry them. The bodies of our mothers rocking with ours, groaning with us when we are ill. The smell still in my nose of my mother's richly metallic fertile blood on the cotex in the bathroom, the carving out of her womb and so many others, the decades beating furiously away, the long awe of their sighs as they settle into our warm cars to be taken to the doctors. The bodies of our fathers, their huge hands under our backs as they teach us how to float, their sturdy shoulders we ride into the breakers. My father's arms cradling my four-year-old body, zonked on the cherries I stole from a tray of Manhattans at an aunt's wedding. Home we go, home on the subway. The careless crowding generations, the cracking of their chests, their plaintive reedy cheeps, but I enjoy it when we urge them not to eat fast food. We carry them, their years fanned out again, unshelved, as we are carried towards the indignities of our own bodies. We are together, undone by time, about to be undone, undone, about to be undone by the bodies that carry us. And in me, my authors dream again as I dream imagining my progeny rebirthing me in all my hope a lustrous dream of being carried forward thanks judy love that poem our next poet at the open mic is dick westheimer hey y'all um as everyone, I so appreciated the features. Um, I have a poem, I can't help myself. I always read the latest one that I've written. And I've written a lot about um, uh, the ongoing war in Gaza the last two months. How the war ends. Even the rocks show no signs of intelligent life. They grind against each other ceaselessly on each side of a sea so dead and salty that even the bricks and stones float. Here, the people reach for boulders to heave across tectonic faults, arch their backs, and weep war songs for their dead. From a faraway star, an astronomer can't believe what he sees. 
the second law of thermodynamics has failed here. What was between the river and sea was subducted by the seething, leaving no trace of the heat released in the warring times. Every neck slit pouring warm blood, every bomb dropped on a child snugged in her bed, every grandfather held in a cold cave, gone. And still, faint signals from Earth revealed debates about whose names are etched on which stones. Politicos with solemn faces rage never again as they each wiped the land clean of the people they promised peace. Lava flows over the land, covers all the borders, the bodies, the guns. At last, both sides have won. Mm. Fabulous. And Yikes. That was great, Dick. You've just been writing those poems lately. Our next poet is Mark Petrie. Hello. Um, God, I love that poem, Indigo. Um, I actually read it in the uh, Copper Canyon collection, 50 Years of Poetry. And I, I just, it was a pleasure to hear it. I was able to read along with it, with the text. Uh, this poem is called Welcoming Winter. Walking the dog at 7.30 PM, bundled in a sweat, Shetland sweater and windbreaker, I realize I've grown more sensitive to cold, but by June, it will only, it will not only be warm, but light this time of the evening. Some say winter and death are part of God's plan, proof of his eternal love. They always describe God as he. And though they know death is part of his plan, abortion isn't. Even when the fetus the mother carries will be born dead. I have all the faith in the world uh, that if there is a God, she doesn't have balls, more like the true Lilith than Satan, though once again, the woman took the rap. In fact, Lilith still lives in the garden where women decide what to do with their bodies, and godly guys neither rape women nor beat their children, a place where women walk naked holding the hand of their child as they bathe in a turquoise pool fed by a pure stream of hope and light. This doesn't mean I don't look at a married woman's backside when I enter Trader Joe's. I'm as much male as the next guy, but having a mother who was raped and being beaten by a drunken father taught me the limits of masculinity. I've reached an age where it doesn't mean as much. When I walk along a beach, the women are pretty but the light traveling 93 million miles, casting a stream of diamonds stretching to the horizon on clear water turned blue by the atmosphere, catches my eye and fills my mind with wonder. At that moment, I know the earth is female. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Our next reader is Vicki. What a what a great reading. Um, I love you, Ellen. I've been following you for a very long time. And I also did one of her craft talks um, some time ago. I think it was your second one. I can't remember. But it was um it was it was very good. Anyway, um, and Jacqueline, your energy just perked me right up. It's like so powerful. Anyway, I'm going to read um a piece called Little Bird, <clears throat> if I can see it. I'm kind of half blind here. As the little bird sits on the top of the curly willow tree, it seems to be looking in on me as I sit at the dining room table. 
Little bird, do you see the tiny Christmas lights through the window? I will give you fresh Christmas nectar, and you can tell me a story of all the hummingbird mothers, fathers, and grand birds flying around the Christmas nectar. <clears throat> there is always enough for your whole family and friends. Little bird, do you know how happy you make me as you sit <clears throat> you as you as you sit right outside my window, po posing for many photos. The colors in your neck, the colors in your neck change with the light, brilliant red, vibrant green. Can I snap quick enough to catch the magic of the colors? I call you little bird, but I really think of you as an angel sent to give me comfort and joy. How can any little bird looking the way you do be anything but divine? Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Vicki. Our next reader is Joanne. I, like everybody else, I'm uh, really blown away by this wonderful reading. And um, I want to thank Ellen. I've been an Ellen groupie for several years, and I really appreciate all I've learned from her. Uh, this is kind of a fairly recent poem. Um, I've been doing a lot of ekphrastic writing lately. So excuse my French in terms of the title, but a uh, conversation with Henri Rousseau about his Vue des Bois de Boulogne. The focal point in the painting, two tiny distant figures. The trees lean towards them, branches snake their long necks to catch a sliver of their communion. In the foreground, each vein of leaf distinct, each blade of grass tongue to speak. Henri, I wondered decades ago in college art history, why did you make those figures the smallest objects in the painting? What good was a focal point if you couldn't tell if it was mother and child, bear and swan, angel and grim reaper, contemplating a deal to disquiet those woods that saw it only shade and light. Still, you were my favorite, not Monet's dreamy cathedrals or Jackson Pollock's splattered ink. You told me not to lose my child's view, even as I penciled my eyebrows and straightened my hair, walked into adulthood pretending I knew where I was going. You paused your lion calmly beside the sleeping gypsy, made the world's strangeness benign enough to embrace. And you tried to warn me, Henri, that our place on this planet is small and blurry. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. And now another acrostic poet, Marjorie. Another Philly girl. Marjorie, are you still here? It looks like you're not. Okay. Well then, Alan Wallowitz, would you step in? Yes, thanks, Robbie. And uh, thanks to Jackie and Ellen. Fabulous reading. Uh, <clears throat> like Dick, uh, I, I can't help but write about current events, even though I'm trying not to. Um, this is called Gravity Will Get Us. Some of us are willing to wait till our native caution fails on the worn and slippery stairs. No matter our disparate falls in the garden or the desert, the reclaimed land or holding the safe door tight against the next volley, it all becomes so much the same in the short history of you and me. Today it's news, tomorrow we're gone. Who has the will to study and learn as Torah demands? Such a short stay. 
everybody's bound to fall. Even the life and balletic among us give way to age and our own sad shuffling. Some will make a thud when we hit the ground, some a noise of lesser note as we learn again, as if we didn't know this is not a movie, no shot, no bang, no dying fall. Sometimes a shatter will sound before we get the sharp reminder what the slimmest shard might do. Let me hide in plain sight long as I can. I'll agree to shut my mouth for now. My forebears knew how to sound grateful and content the price for being taken in. But one dyspeptic uncle, always a stranger, warned never to feel safe, even here in the golden land. Ha! Ah, his voice, though not heard for years, now rings like an alarm in my ears. Boychik, you just wait and see. And now our editor, Jim Lewis. I have two fairly short poems to read. They are both about a wonderful little creature I found when I finally got around to planting flowers for the first time ever, and they haven't died yet. So this first one is called, I Water My Blood Red Dahlias. Resident mantis, thin and green, rises at the first drops of water. I greet him and ask how his day is going. Tell him of my pain for the newest war. The bloody horrors of terrorism echoed in these blood-red blossoms. He climbs eagerly onto my outstretched hand, cocks his head to one side, listening. And the second is sort of a reprise on this little fellow. And it's called Babel. After the great flood dried, a certain mighty man swore revenge against the heavens, built a spiraling tower, destination, face of God. Mantis scrambles up the highest flower. Man-made rain has fallen more than 40 days. He eagerly mounts my hand, scales my arm, determined to likewise take revenge. I name him Nimrod. <laughs> Thank you. Didn't mean to mute myself because I'm next and last. And I want to read one poem in honor of Ellen's poem for her dog. This is my poem for my my late cat, Whistler. And uh, Whistler, even with those ice blue eyes, he's soft in every way, hairless belly bulging like a Buddha's, crooked tail, a hoisted flag. He's clumsy, missing most leaps by half a foot. He pursues me, lies on my pillow, seeks out my scent. With one eye on the monitor where a bird flits across the screen, he grooms me, pink tongue feathered all over with small hooks, but would never deign to play with any silly toy I wave before he, his eyes. He is my other self, the one who wonders what's in that tree, who needs only a window to feel he's seen the world. And my last 
poem, the last poem of this reading, will be um, Philly people will recognize this. I used to ride the Frankfurt elevated train all of the time downtown from my home in Northeast Philadelphia. And this poem in an abbreviated form that I'm gonna read now will be in the um, Pennsylvania, the anthology of Pennsylvania poetry uh, edited uh, by Marjorie Maddox and one other person whose name I don't remember. I, and this is the epigraph by Buckminster Fuller. I realized intuitively that the subway was a harbinger of an entirely new space-time relationship of the individual and his environment. Boarding, I am full of voices, turning in my seat to watch the Delaware's brown flow, York and Dauphin. The wires stretch like swimmers, speak a secret tongue, black and flat, crackling leaves. Though it is summer, the pool waits, an empty mouth. Huntington, here a man boards without eyes. His face holds light. Rain falls in flat, wet drops. Somerset, the name I always read wrong. Summery, Summerfield, something. Allegheny. Banks on both sides. I sit on the edge of my seat, reading Dr. Cool number one on all the walls. Someone beside me slips out. Tioga, trees, ginkgos, grilled leaves, a thousand luna moths. Eerie Tarsdale, the day the train fell. It was here. People clutched at legs, falling poles. One second before the ground, the last smoke. Now, when I pass here, the train shifts and slows. On the track ahead, workers wave us past. Church, broken windows, stained with soot, a steeple with no bell, the train screams by. Marjorie and Orthodox, Margaret and Orthodox, unloading, I turn once more, eyeing faces pressed like wings, no wheels now, the circling slatted door, the stairs, then the streets, long spiral, a track. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you to, to our features, Jacqueline Ostro and Ellen Bass. I'm looking forward to seeing you in a few weeks in your class, Ellen, and I hope some of these folks will be joining us. Thanks so much, Ravi. I hope so, too. I hope you all come. It's going to be incredible this time. I'm going to stop the recording and um, 